record. Okay, so Sparrows 101, hopefully without further interruptions. So basics of bird ID, familiarize yourself with your field guide. When you get out in the field and start seeing birds, note your general size and shape of the birds, uh, any color patterns you might see. Uh, is it a really dark sparrow? Does it have a light throat like this little guy sitting here in the reeds, which if you can't identify now, you should be able to identify by the end of this talk. And you want to check for any field marks, see if there's any uh, eye, eye line, eye ring, is there a wing bar showing, uh, anything you can notice that kind of stands out on the bird, different color lures, size of the bill, uh, and watch for behavior and habitat, which can be very important with identifying sparrows, because you want to see if they're in a grassy marshy area, or are they out in the middle of a field, or are they sitting high up in a tree, all of that can help you identify what kind of sparrow you're looking at. And finally, of course, see is it making any sounds, because you can identify birds by their vocalizations. So uh, hopefully the audio will play when I start doing the sounds here, but uh, We'll talk a little bit about identifying sparrows by sound as well. So you do need to know a little bit of bird anatomy. Uh, this is your basic sparrow uh, anatomy. Uh, there's the front, there's brown down here. They've got fluff. Uh, obviously, it's not the actual one. <laughs> this is the actual sparrow anatomy. Just put the other one in there for a little bit of fun. But uh, a few things to look at when you're uh, noticing field marks on the sparrows is you want to note the lores, which is this area right here in front of the eyes. Uh, you'll want to uh, notice the malar stripe, this big uh, kind of usually triangular stripe on the side of the throat, see if that's a, a special color, see if it's uh, very large or prominent, as different sparrows have different sizes on their malar stripes. And of course, you want to look at the tail, notice if there's any white in the outer tail feathers, uh, look on the crown, what color is the crown. Uh, obviously, the more field marks, the better you can get on the sparrows, but lures usually play a pretty big part in sparrow identification. Malar stripe can play quite a bit. Uh, color of the crown and if there's any stripe going across the crown can all be uh, very important to identifying your sparrows. So now we will move on to the next page. If I can clear these an annotations, there we go. So a little bit more uh, on bird anatomy is just looking at the different parts of the wings because when you do see a sparrow sometimes you'll notice that there's uh, different colors in the secondaries or primaries. They might have uh, different uh, colors of wing coverts, different markings around there. So just being able to uh, understand some of the terms that the field guides use on sparrows uh, will help you be able to identify them a lot more quickly and a lot more reliably and be able to communicate with other birders more clearly about what you're seeing on the bird. As you can make up names for something that sound right, or you can use the actual uh, sparrow anatomy that is written down and it kind of gives you the universal language of bird identification. This is good for anything, not just sparrows. So then the next thing you want to figure out for your sparrow identification is, is it a sparrow? Uh, there are sparrow-like birds that can cause confusion, and there are birds that are obviously not sparrows, like this little guy here. Uh, you can look at it and be pretty sure that you're not looking at a sparrow. This is a rosea spoonbill. Then there are a few other things that can look somewhat similar to sparrows, uh, like the jack sparrow here, uh, but that it would not be something that you would find in your birding field guide. Uh, <laughs> but you want to learn to identify your sparrow-like birds and kind of narrow down your options. So we'll go through a few different species here, like wrens. Wrens can have sparrow-like behavior and habitat, but the main difference is the bill. Their behavior is a little different as well, but if you see that long pointy bill, that is not a sparrow. Sparrows have short conical bills. Some are larger than others, but you'll never see one long and pointy like this wren. Uh, the wrens also usually have harsher alarm calls. They're a little bit more vocal. Sparrows will chip and sing, but you usually won't find a sparrow doing a scold call unless you're actually approaching a nest site and they're getting really, really agitated. Uh, and the wrens, they move a little differently. They hunt for insects. They don't just sit on the ground and forage for seeds. Uh, some warblers can be very sparrow-like. For instance, this is a yellow rump warbler, our uh, friendly little butterbutt, and they can, in some cases, look kind of like sparrows. Again, the bill shape is different. They're generally sleeker, uh, but if you see that pointed bill, 
you're not looking at a sparrow, you'll want to look at some of the other families of birds. Mini warblers, of course, are very brightly colored, but some can be somewhat drab and sparrow-like, like our little yellow rump warbler here. Uh, a big one that gets a lot of people is the red-winged blackbird female. The male can be fairly obvious. He's black and he's got a big red wing, but the uh, female red-winged blackbird does get confused fairly often uh, as a sparrow. The, so one of the big differences is they're bigger. Uh, red-winged blackbirds are a larger bird than basically any sparrow. The Harris's sparrow is our largest sparrow and it is smaller than a female red-winged blackbird. The bill is also a little bit more pointed in the red wing, uh, but uh, it, it can kind of at a distance look like a sparrow beak. But notice how heavy the streaking is on the breast. None of our sparrows, uh, at least here in the United States, have that much streaking on the breast. They will have, some have big heavy streaks, but it won't be that heavy and it'll be a lot more patterned. You'll see singular straight lines of streaks instead of just a whole wild bunch of static looking streaks on the breast. And then it has a nice buffy throat and face, which, well, yes, there are some sparrows that also do show that it's not as prominent as in the red winged blackbird. So uh, learn to recognize your female red winged blackbirds and you'll be able to eliminate them from uh, consideration when you're looking for sparrows and just be able to quickly identify this bird that happens to look like a number of other different birds. So let's get on to some sparrows now. The first one will be one that a lot of people probably recognize and have seen, the house sparrow. This is not a native sparrow here, but it is a very widespread sparrow now. Uh, it's uh, an introduced species, it's an old world sparrow, but uh, I call it the Walmart sparrow because you usually see them sitting around in Walmart parking lots. You hear them chirping, you see them making noise, building their nests, big messy nests up in the uh, signs for the stores. But uh, it, it, it is a sparrow, so I needed to include it here. The male is down here in the right-hand corner. He's got a rusty nape, gray crown, and an obvious black throat. The female can kind of blend in and look more like other sparrows. She's not as strikingly marked. All, all brown underparts, brown wings with kind of a buffy tinge. And the, the biggest giveaway is the bill. It's a different shape bill than most of our sparrows here. It's larger. It looks more like a corn kernel. The only other sparrow that you might see around here with a big corn kernel looking bill is a fox sparrow. And they have very distinct kind of triangle spots going all down their breast. So if you see a, a big yellow bill with a singular buffy eyebrow and a clean gray belly, you're probably looking at a female house sparrow. They have a nice curve on the top of the beak giving a rounded appearance as well. And let's see if the sound plays through. This is a uh, very frequent sound you'll hear in any urban area these days. Just a constant chirp, chirp, chirp. It's very blurry sounding. And that is what you're uh, typical house sparrow sounds like. So now let's move on to a few more of the fun sparrows that we have here in Texas. Uh, these are the ones that sometimes give people a little bit of pause. They're somewhat similar. So I'm going to go through these kind of group together. I'm not going through these sparrows in taxonomic order. I'm going through them kind of grouped together in sparrows that you might see in the same place and uh, confuse Get, get them confused with each other. So the Spizella sparrows, we have four Spizella sparrows, three of which are very similar. It's the chipping sparrow, the clay colored sparrow, brewer's sparrow, and field sparrow. They're small, they're frequent feeder visitors. Uh, all of the adult birds have pale unstreaked breasts. The juveniles, which I have shown here of the three uh, most similar ones, do have streaky little breasts. So juvenile chipping sparrow, clay colored and brewers all have little streaky breasts and can look very, very similar. Uh, uh, young birds and molting birds, which you will be starting to see this time of year, can show kind of conflicting field marks as they're transitioning from their streaky juvenile plumage to their uh, unstreaked adult plumage. But let's kind of break these down a little bit. Uh, the first one is the chipping sparrow. Uh, it's the winter horde sparrow that shows up at your feeders by the 
dozens or even by the hundreds. They are one of our most common feeder sparrows here in the wintertime. And they are usually only here in the wintertime. Some will stick around through spring, but they don't stick around for summer. Uh, there's, uh, you get some variation in them, but they're overall cool gray breast with a, uh, a varying black or pink bill. In their breeding plumage, the adults have a bright rufous crown. So if you see this small sparrow, unstreaked breast, lots of them at your feeders, and they have a rufous crown, you can be pretty sure that that is a chipping sparrow. We will talk about the rufous crown sparrow here in a second, but they are visually different than your chipping sparrows. You don't see them in huge numbers like you do the chippies. Uh, like I said, their uh, breasts are streaked or are unstreaked, but their crown in non-breeding plumage is kind of a, a streaked uh, color on the crown, which I will show some examples of here in a second. And it is uh, solid, not bisected. Uh, so there's not really that much of a line down the middle. You can see a little bit in their breeding plumage, but not a whole lot. Uh, one of the biggest field marks that can help you identify these guys is that they're they have a dark black eye line that goes from behind the eyes to the front of the eyes. Uh, I'll underline it on this guy right here. See, in front of the eye, he's got a little black mark. The other Spizella sparrows do not have a line that extends all the way through the eye. So if you see dark in front of the eye on any of these little Spizella sparrows, you are looking at a chipping sparrow and they have a pale crescent above and below the eye. It's basically a, a full eye ring that is broken by this single black line going through the eye. So they have white crescent above, white crescent below the eye. Again, if you see that, you're probably looking at a chipping sparrow. The nape, the back of the neck is gray with two blurry lines that you can kind of see in some future pictures. And uh, they have a very light malar stripe, this little area coming down kind of on the chin. You can see it doesn't have a lot of contrast there, but you can still see they've got a little malar stripe with some dark and light going down there. May have a slight dark border, but it's not super pronounced. You'll see the importance of that on our next slide. But the juvenile, as I showed in the previous picture, does have a heavily streaked breast. But here, let me play the sound of the chipping sparrow. And you can hear where they get their name from. It's just a very dry, staccato, singular note, uh, rapid chipping. And you will start to hear them sing as spring gets a little closer. They don't usually sing throughout winter. You'll just hear single little chip notes. But as spring gets closer and they're getting ready to migrate up to their breeding territory, they will start uh, doing their, their song. But here's their call. Just a single soft chip note. So now the next Spizella sparrow that we have a possibility to see around here is the clay colored sparrow. Uh, I kind of call it the surprised looking sparrow because to me, it kind of looks a little surprised. This one is a little bit smaller body and bill than a chipping sparrow. They are uh, overall roughly the same size, but they're a little bit more delicate looking. These do have an almost entirely pink bill and a very small head. Uh, so chipping sparrow, they can be pink or black. If you see a lot of black on the bill, probably not a, cl a clay colored sparrow. You're probably still looking at a chipping sparrow. Overall, this bird has a very buffy appearance, warm overall, not uh, super grayish. They have a little, they have gray on the nape, but the breast of the sparrow is going to look a little bit more warm and buffy. But don't be confused because this can be influenced by the sunlight. If you're seeing a sparrow and it's in this nice, gorgeous morning light, he's probably going to look a lot buffier than if you're looking at a sparrow on a somewhat overcast midday with more grayish uh, or bluish light coming down from the sky and not having that nice warm appearance. So don't be fooled just by gorgeous warm sunlight coming up in the morning. But overall, this bird will look a little bit more buffy. Now the crown is more of a, a light nutty brown. So the chipping sparrow can either have the uh, rufous crown or a really dark uh, streaked crown. Uh, on the clay colored sparrow, it's more nutty brown and it is bisected by a notable white bar down the, right down the middle of the crown that goes all the way down to the nape. So you'll see two distinct bars on the nape of the neck if you ever see them from behind. And I believe I do have some pictures of that coming up in a few slides. 
And on this one, the dark eye line only goes behind the eye. It does not extend up into the front of the eye. And it does not have uh, uh, any dark in the lores, very pale lores and uh, not really any uh, eye arcs. So like the chipping sparrow has a that bisected eye ring. You'll see that sometimes on the lower portion of the eye on the clay colored sparrow, but not ever above the eye. Uh, they have a dark, very dark malar contrasting with white. So you can see right here, they have a lot more noticeable white down there with black borders. So you'll see a very well-defined malar stripe, unlike the chipping sparrow that does not have this extremely well-defined. It looks a lot more sharper. So you'll notice in the clay colored sparrow, it'll look like he has a lot more sharply defined features on his face. Uh, and since he doesn't have that arc over the eye and not nearly as much dark above the eye as the chipping sparrow, that's what I always think gives him more of a surprised look. It looks like his eyebrows are raised a little bit because he doesn't have that big eye arc going above the eye. Uh, their song and call is a very raspy, dried out song. So let me play that. It's almost a buzz saw. Uh, and they usually do it in, in three notes like this but noticeably different from the chipping sparrow that has just a, a rapid trill of single chip notes. This one has three very well-defined buzzing sounds. And again, juveniles can be streaky on the breast. So here is a comparison of chipping on the left and clay colored on the right, where you can really see those facial differences. Again, on the chipping sparrow, they've got this nice, big, uh, dark uh, eye line in front of the eye, which is completely lacking in the clay colored sparrow. And the arcs below the eye on the chipping sparrow and above the eye are lacking. You can see on this example of this clay colored sparrow, he does have an arc below the eye, but nothing noticeable above the eye. He has that nice nutty brown crest with a uh, very well-defined white eyebrow that kind of gives him that more surprised appearance in my opinion, while the chipping sparrow, uh, uh, the eyes look a little bit more squinted down. Just the overall face looks a little bit more, I guess, focused uh, due to those uh, uh, facial markings that he has. Again, we're kind of anthropomorphizing these animals by giving them these descriptions, but it, if it helps you remember how to identify them, I'm all for it. And also note the lighting in these pictures. The chipping sparrow does look a lot buffier in this picture. And that's just due to light balance and the light that this chipping sparrow was taken in versus the light that the clay colored was taken in. So those are just some things that can kind of trip you up if you're trying to go off of general impressions. But overall, just look at the chipping sparrow and then glance over to the clay colored and see how much more bold that malar stripe and more well-defined the facial markings are. Uh, on the chipping sparrow, it all kind of blends together. The only really obvious marking is that big dark eye line. But on the clay colored sparrow, all the different colors on the face are, are more distinct. So if you see that and you notice that, it means you should probably take a closer look at the sparrow to see if you're looking at a clay colored. Then the uh, most confusing Spizella sparrow for a lot of people is the Brewer's sparrow. Uh, I call it the Tennessee warbler of sparrows because it's identified by its lack of field marks. This one is somewhat rare in the hill country. They do show up. I've seen them around San Marcos. It, it's our smallest sparrow in North America and they are very nondescript and pale. Gray breast, like all the other Spizella sparrows, they don't have any streaking on the breast. Uh, very light brown body, very lightly streaked crown. It's not nearly as well defined or as dark as the chipping sparrow or the clay colored sparrow. Almost no well defined markings on the face. There is no big dark eye line going behind the eye like in the clay colored or going all the way through the eye like in the chipping sparrow. This. Uh, is basically the polar opposite of these three sparrows from the clay colored as far as well-defined facial markings. There just are not anything on this bird that is super well-defined. Sometimes you'll see this white malar stripe coming down here a little bit, and that might be the one part that pops out on the sparrow, but then just notice the lack of any other well-defined features on the face. And if you see them next to chipping sparrows or clay colored sparrows, you'll notice that their beak looks smaller and they're just overall a more smaller, more delicate sparrow than all the other ones. 
And again, this is not a super common sparrow here in the hill country, but if you go out to West Texas, they are a fairly numerous sparrow. You can get them up in the panhandle or out in West Texas, and they'll be mixed in with sparrow flocks of all the other types of Spizella sparrows. Uh, but overall, they, they do have a little bit of an eye ring, but again, not anything super, super contrasty like in the clay colored sparrow. And again, juvenile has a uh, uh, very streaked on the breast, but we generally don't see the juveniles around here this time of year. Let's see if I can get the sound to play. So much, much different song than uh, the other two Spizella sparrows. He has multiple notes, not just a buzzy sound. It's actually a fairly pretty little song, but if you see a little nondescript sparrow, that is giving this wonderful, varied, beautiful call, you're probably looking at a brewer's sparrow. So now one final comparison of all of these, just kind of from the back, looking at the nape. Uh, let me get the annotations here again. Uh, you can see on the chipping sparrow, remember they don't really have a bisected crown. So it's all kind of runs together on the top. Uh, it does come uh, split a little part in the back behind the nape, but uh, again, it's almost a solid bar going all down the head and down the back of the nape. On the clay colored sparrow, it does have a bisected crown and all the way down the nape, you'll see that it is separate. You'll have nutty brown on either side. And then even down on the back of the sparrow, you'll see the nape kind of uh, spreads apart into two uh, separate distinct lines. And then the brewer's sparrow, it's just a nondescript mass of everything kind of blending together. But there is one more Spizella sparrow that we haven't talked about, and that is the field sparrow. Uh, I think of it, uh, when I see this sparrow, I see it's a very pink looking sparrow with a fat head. They have a much larger rounder head than all the other Spizella sparrows, very pink beak. It's the largest of the Spizella sparrows, much bulkier appearance, head is just proportionally larger. Usually I can identify this guy just by looking at the silhouette, but if you see a bird mixed in with your chipping sparrows or you see something that looks like it might kind of have the shape of a chipping sparrow, but just does not have any of the dark facial markings and looks very pinkish overall with a big fat head, that is our field sparrow. It has a big pink bill, pale gray face. Uh, it does have an eye ring if you look closely, but it has an overall very pale face, so that might not be a very distinct field mark. But the main thing you can see is there's no black on the face. All the other Spizella sparrows had some sort of black markings, either uh, a black eye line or black malar stripes or just very nondescript grayish brown appearance overall like the Brewer's Sparrow. But this guy, He's very pink on top of the head, has a little pink behind the eye, but no other dark facial markings on the face. So this is a fairly obvious sparrow once you realize to look for those field marks. Let me play his song. Kind of a, a rapidly uh, speeding up whistle. And these guys, they do sing all throughout the winter. I've been hearing them in my yard. Uh, so you can listen for this guy and you'll probably hear him around even this time of year if you go out into a more grassy field area. And they do occasionally come into feeders and this is their little chip note. But usually you'll see them out uh, just singing in a field somewhere perched up on a bush. So now let's move on to our next kind of little subset of sparrows, our streaky grassland sparrows. Let me get some water. These are medium to large sparrows, prefer open fields, grasslands, sometimes in, into kind of sparse wooded areas. And you see them foraging on the ground in the grass or in the open. Uh, a lot of these birds that I'll be mentioning here, you'll see flush from roadsides. If you're driving down a grassy road and you see sparrows flushing off the side of the roads, these next few I'm gonna be talking about are probably going to be ones that you'll want to look at. And depending on area of your range, some of these sparrows can be fairly variable. You get these grassland birds uh, that kind of get specialized adaptations depending on which habitat they happen to be in. They're still the same species, but you just get different variations. Like both of these birds on this picture here, 
are savannah sparrows, but one is much more streaky and the other looks more spotted. So speaking of savannah sparrows, let's talk about him first. Uh, this is the quintessential grassland sparrow. If you're driving through a grassy field or walking through a grassy field, you're probably going to see these guys flushing off the side of the path, flying across the grass and landing farther away down in the grass. Very small uh, or very common, uh, small or small-ish size sparrow. They're not quite as small as a chipping sparrow, but of the grassland sparrows, they are generally a little bit smaller. There are, like I mentioned, different variations of them. They all have, to some extent, streaking or more speckly like markings on the breast, and the belly is going to be white. So again, this part of the breast here is streaky, but all the way down here on the belly is usually going to be plain white. Uh, most of the savanna sparrows will show yellow in the lores to some extent. You can see them on both of these birds here. They do have yellow in the lores and sometimes extending into uh, part of the crown stripe. But uh, they don't always show this super obviously. It can be a very, very pale yellow. So don't, if you don't see yellow at all, don't completely discount savanna sparrow. But if you do see yellow and it's in a field and it's very streaky, uh, you're probably going to be looking at a savanna sparrow. There are a few other sparrows with yellow lores, but their habitats or their other markings are uh, fairly well different from the savanna sparrow. Uh, so some of these show very light pale in the outer tail feathers when they're flying. You will see like that one outer tail feather might have a, a lighter coloration but it's not a super distinct obvious white in the tail like you'll see in other sparrows. But again, if you do see a little bit of white in the tail, that doesn't necessarily mean it's not savanna sparrow, but if you see them flying away from you and you don't see white in the tail, that can be a good indication that you are also looking at a savanna sparrow if you notice that it's streaky and you're out in a big grassy field. They do have a darker eye line. Uh, above the yellow and a fairly distinct dark malar stripe coming down here on the side of the face. And as I've said, they like open grassy fields, often away from cover. They, they will sometimes perch in a bush. They more often like to perch on a fence line or on something exposed out in the middle of the field or just simply plop themselves down in grassy cover and you see them flush out of the grass and then land in more grass. So you might see this bird just kind of skimming over the grass and not perching anywhere in the open. They often, if you flush them, will just land in the grass and run along the ground. So it, even if you walk over to the same area that the sparrow was in, they could be 10, 20 feet away by the time you get there just from running along the ground and you will never see that sparrow again. Let's play their song a little bit. Kind of a little buzzy there to the end, a few chips at the beginning. Uh, this again kind of varies a little bit from place to place. But the grassland sparrows generally throw in this kind of ticky buzzy sound and they, they, they vary the pattern a little bit. And then here's a very sharp chip note. It's almost cardinal-like in its chip note. So if you hear something that sounds sort of like a cardinal, but not exactly right, coming from a small clump of grass on the side of the trail, it's a good chance that you're listening to a savanna sparrow chipping at you. Now, the next most common one that you'll see out in the grasslands is the Vesper Sparrow. I kind of consider it a chunky savanna sparrow because they have very similar field marks to a savanna sparrow, but they're bigger. They're a larger and heavier bird than savanna sparrow. So if you see a flock of sparrows flush out of the grass, some are smaller, some are bigger, it's probably a mix of savanna and vesper sparrow. These have very uh, strong streaking on the breast, but fainter on the flanks. So notice how it has all this streaking up here on the breast, but not nearly as much down here on the sides. You, there will be some, but it'll be a lot more streaking on the flanks in a savanna sparrow versus uh, the vesper sparrow. Another thing that, we'll, that you'll notice fairly often on this bird is it does have a large white eye ring, which is lacking in the savanna sparrow. Savanna sparrow doesn't really show much of an eye ring. If you see a big, bold eye ring on a streaky sparrow in a grassy field, you're probably looking at a vesper sparrow. But as you can see on this other image on the right, it doesn't always show a prominent eye ring, but there is one there. 
And uh, if you do see them flying away from you, which uh, you're, you're looking at sparrows, there's a pretty good chance you will see them flying away from you. Uh, they have very distinct white outer tail feathers in flight, much more than the little hint of white that you'll occasionally get on the savanna sparrows. These guys always have a lot of white in the outer tail feathers. So if you see lots of white flying away from you and you notice the streaking on the breast, you're probably looking at a Vesper Sparrow versus the Savannah Sparrow. They do have Rufus Lesser Coverts, which is this part on the shoulder. Not always visible, but if you do see them perched somewhere and you see a little Rufus shoulder patch like that, that is a clear indicator that you're looking at a Vesper Sparrow. Now, overall, fairly warm plumage appearance. You see them in grassy fields. They'll be on the side of a trail. And with Savannah Sparrow, when you flush them, they'll often go back down into the grass. They might perch on a fence for a second, but they'll go back down into the grass. The Vesper Sparrow, if you flush them up, uh, they will often sit up on a tree and let you have actually fairly decent looks at them for a more extended period of time. They won't immediately vanish back down into the grass. Sometimes they will, but that's a behavioral difference between the Savannah Sparrow and the Vesper Sparrow is the Vesper Sparrow will actually sit up and give you a fairly decent look. So if it's if it's being a cooperative, my first thought is usually Vesper Sparrow. And if it's sitting there for a while, it'll let you look at these other field marks. So let's play its song a little bit. So it doesn't have that same buzzy tone as the Savannah Sparrow. It's it's a little more musical, not as as buzzy. And while they're singing, these birds will sit up on a branch and actually give you a, a view of them. And here's their chip note, a little harsher than Savannah Sparrow. And if so, if you hear something sitting up higher in a bush, giving this harsher chip note, uh, again, I would think Vesper Sparrow for that. And here's a side-by-side -side of some specimens of Savannah and Vesper Sparrow. Savannah is here on the left and the Vesper is on the right. You can notice the size difference. And also notice, you can see there's very little white in the outer tail feathers here, while there is prominent white in the outer tail feathers on the Vesper Sparrow. So a lot more white, a lot more noticeable white in the Vesper Sparrow. And there is some uh, streaking on the flanks here, but it is a little bit bolder and more well-defined here on the Savannah Sparrow. Go to the next slide. There we go. All right, now on to some other uh, streaky sparrows, the Melospiza sparrows. Uh, this is generally the two of these that you're going to see around here are going to be Lincoln's and Song Sparrow. These are streaky sparrows. They're generally chunky, mid-sized sparrows. They forage on the ground. They like to stay near cover. Uh, but these guys, unlike the Savannah Sparrow and the Vesper Sparrow, they like more wooded areas, more wet areas, uh, marshy areas, uh, which kind of gives you a hint on the other type of sparrow we might talk about here. Uh, and these guys, they are not going to be out in a dry grassy field as often as being somewhere where there's a bit more cover and uh, a bit more foliage and bushes for them to hide in. You can get these guys in woodlands. You can get these guys in swampy, marshy areas. It doesn't have to be just a big open field. And honestly, I don't usually see these guys in just a big open grassy prairie. They like to have more cover and more substantial habitat. And these birds will come to feeders. They really like seed on the ground near cover. So if you have bird feeders set up and you want to attract these sparrows, <clears throat> You probably won't get them coming to a tube feeder, but if you take some seed and you scatter it on the ground in the bushes near the edge of your birding area in your backyard, if you've got a brush pile or something, toss some seed in there and these guys will come to it. So you can see here on the left is the Lincoln Sparrow and on the right is the Song Sparrow. Lincoln Sparrow is a little bit grayer, a little bit more finely proportioned, not as chunky as the larger Song Sparrow on the right. Let's talk about these birds uh, individually. So the song sparrow, uh, is, I call him the stout sparrow. He is just a very strongly built, uh, heavily built, stout looking sparrow. He's got a big heavy beak. He's got bold streaks on the breast, uh, kind of a rounded, uh, well-proportioned, kind of chunky sized head, but he's just a very strong, stout looking sparrow. Everything on this bird is well-defined and broad. He's got these big, big, heavy streaks on the breast, 
often a big central breast spot. Uh, and when you look at the malar stripe, look at how large it is. See this very large triangular uh, malar stripe and then uh, kind of the buffy sub, uh, this is the mustachial stripe here, and this is the sub mustachial stripe, which is this buffy part here. Uh, it can be white, like in this guy down here, or it can be buffy, but no matter which one you're looking at, they all have that very dark, uh, broad malar stripe. And uh, the, just look for that. If you see that big dark triangle underneath a big heavy bill, that's already a pretty good indicator that you're looking at a song sparrow. Uh, they have a rounded brown tail. There's no white in the tail of this sparrow. And they usually like to forage at the edge of cover, but they're not afraid of being out in the open. They will wander out into a grassy cut. If you have a mowed backyard, they will go wander out into the middle there. They're not afraid of being exposed, but they will sit up and sing in a uh, grassy cover as well. Uh, let's play the song of the song sparrow. <clears throat> very sharp, cheery song, and they are very, very varied. So there, I don't remember exactly how many different songs they have, but there are, I think, at least 60 of them. But this is their call note. It sounds like going chimp, chimp, chimp. It is very distinct. This is, this is another little kind of uh, contact call. But if you hear that chimp, chimp, chimp note, like you can hear him doing it there, that is very uh, diagnostic of song sparrow. There's nothing, no other sparrow out there that really goes chimp, chimp, chimp while sitting halfway uh, up a strand of grass uh, in, in some cover. So listen for that. If you hear that, you're probably finding a song sparrow. And these guys are very responsive to pishing. If you pish, they will probably chimp, chimp, do that little call note back at you. Next one, the Lincoln Sparrow. Call it the Shadow Sparrow because it's much more grayish overall, a little darker colored than the Song Sparrow, and he's smaller and more delicate. Note the streaking on the breast. He is streaked like the Song Sparrow, but very, very finely. It's not those big, heavy, heavy marks. He does have a little central breast spot, but again, it's less well-defined. And if you see the breast, they always have this big buffy breast band. The song sparrow is pure white across the breast, but the Lincoln sparrow has this buffy breast band uh, going all the way across the breast behind those streaks. So if you see that, you are looking at a Lincoln sparrow. If you just see the face, it's a very cool gray face, has a little dark peaked crown, not a whole lot of facial markings going on. He does not have that big bold malar stripe. He does have a little bit of one underneath a buffy sub mustachial stripe, but it's not big and bold. So again, song sparrow can have buffy or white sub mustachial stripe. The Lincoln sparrow just has buffy and does not have that big bold malar stripe. It's much finer than in the song sparrow. So if you don't see that standing out and you see everything else look more finely proportioned, you're probably looking at a Lincoln sparrow. And these guys like to stay close to bushes and damp areas. They don't like to leave cover. I rarely see one hop more than a few feet out away from uh, a, a bush or a brush pile or something. They'll sit up on top of it. These birds are also very responsive to pishing and they will pop out and stare you down if you pish at them and they pop up out of that brush, but they don't like foraging farther out into open grassy areas. So if you see one of these guys, uh, and he's really reluctant to come out of the shadows, you're probably looking at a Lincoln Sparrow. We'll play a little bit of their song. Another very melodious song. Uh, it, I guess it's a little bit more blurry and not as clear as the song Sparrow, but they don't have the, the, the chimp call note. They have, let's see if this, I hope this recording has the call note, it should. Yeah, it's a drier, drier, click, 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 click. And if you pish, they will do this. They will respond with that little dry chip note, kind of a, a low, uh, low pitch, dry chip, 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 or tick, tick, tick. Uh, unlike the chimp, chimp, more uh, loud and out there and bold song or, or call of the song sparrow.
And then there's the other Melospiza that we might get around here, the waterlogged sparrow, the swamp sparrow. This guy is, they're related to Lincoln's in song. They're very similar in shape to Lincoln's in song, similar behavior, but much warmer plumage overall. And they lack that heavy barring or streaking that both of the uh, previous Melospizas have. They have rufous on the wings, uh, very heavy stripes down the back, but the face is clean and gray. It doesn't have the other more defined markings that the other sparrows have. They don't have a big bold mallard stripe. They don't have a big bold submustachial stripe. They do have one kind of tapering eye line going behind the eye and a nice little kind of almost rufousy looking crown, uh, very reddish on the wings and very faint blurry streaks on the breast. It's not very much. You can see a little bit here and there but not much in the way of streaking on the breast. I always think that this guy kind of looks like someone took a swamp sparrow and kept dunking him in the swamp so much that all the colors kind of ran together and blurred. So if you see that, if you see a sparrow that looks like all the colors have been washed out and ran together, that's probably a swamp sparrow. And habitat can be very, very important in identifying this guy because they do not really leave the swamp. They stick near the water. You'll see them in reeds. You'll see them on edges of ponds, anywhere where there's water, which again, you can have song sparrows in that area. But if you are in a more dry wooded area, you will almost never see a swamp sparrow unless it's just very, very lost. These guys are almost always within sight of water. And let's play a little bit of their song. It's kind of more reminiscent of the chipping sparrow just in the pattern. It's much higher pitched, much clearer and ringing song, but it's just that single notes repeated very quickly. And you'll hear this coming from a, a growth of reeds and you'll know that you're listening to a swamp sparrow. And there's just, it's kind of a, more of a, it almost sounds more like a Phoebe going peep, 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 instead of a sparrow chip note for their call note. So if you hear something coming from a whole bunch of reeds that sounds kind of like an Eastern Phoebe's chip note, you're most likely listening to a swamp sparrow, unless there's a, a Phoebe perched down in there for some reason. So now let's get on to some more open area grassland sparrows, open area sparrows that are unstreaked. All the sparrows that we've been talking about were the more streaky type sparrows. But let's look at some of the sparrows that you might encounter in some of these similar places. You're out in an open grassland area or an open field and you see sparrows that don't have any streaks on them. So a lot of these sparrows are not afraid of being seen in open areas. Some will skulk around down in, some, in the brush and not come out in the open too readily, but others will just perch straight down in the middle of an open road and not care at all about it. Uh, most of these sparrows that I'm going to talk about are fairly large and overall have a fairly clean overall appearance. They don't look blurry or streaky. They just have a very nice, well put together, clean appearance to them. And so the first one that comes to mind of these guys is the lark sparrow. I, I, oh, he always looks like he has kind of an old style flight helmet on, kind of like an aviator style facial appearance. So I call him the aviator sparrow. Uh, it's a very large, very bold, very distinctive sparrow. Uh, they have kind of an upright lark-like stance where they get their name here. Instead of being hunched over like some sparrows are, you'll see them perched sitting more vertically. But just look at those facial markings. Everything is bold and well-defined. Big, bold eye line. They have a big, bold malar stripe down here. Everything else is white. They've got this big, bold reddish cheek patch and a big, bold crown. Everything on this bird is big, clear, and bold. Uh, and then when you see them fly, they have very obvious white in the tail feathers. And it's not just on the edge. It kind of curves all around the edge of the tails and towards the tip of the tail. So it's a, a different pattern of white in the tail than you would see in a Vesper Sparrow. So if you just see them flying away, this tail is much more rounded than the Vesper Sparrow and the white continues all the way down around the edges, uh, kind of down towards the tip of the Sparrow. But when you see them, even if you see them fly, you can usually see this very, very clear facial markings on them. Uh, the breast is unstreaked, but sometimes they can show a dark central spot. Uh, just kind of light streaked brown on the back. And uh, you'll see these in groups perching in fields, perching on the ground or in open branches. 
they're overall, they're not a shy sparrow. You'll see them just clear out in the open. Uh, but Len, let me play their song. They sound like they've, they're singing and they've got radio interference. So you hear those little buzzes in there? So if you hear something that's beautifully singing this song and every now and then they get a little bzzz, that's a lark sparrow. It, they kind of sound, they have very similar to bunting sounding songs. And here's their little chip note. It's just a very faint little, little chip. But they sing very readily and they sing frequently. And uh, it, it kind of sounds like a, a very melodious bunting like song but has those little random interference bzz, uh, interjections in there. So I, I always think it sounds like they're, they're playing their song on a radio and there's a lightning storm nearby and every now and then there's just a little bit of a crackle of static and interference in their song. Now I did want to throw this guy in there. This is a partially leucistic lark sparrow just to show that the field marks aren't always going to be exactly the same when you're looking at these birds in the field. He is much more white on the face. Uh, he's missing a lot of his coloration on top of the head. It, it's just pure white. But you can still see all the other field marks. You see the white in the tail. You just see the, sh the uh, elongated shape of this bird. You should still be able to identify this as a lark sparrow. But if it's a little different from what's in your book, well, that's nature. Sometimes they look a little different. And now we get to another uh, sparrow here that is the Rufus crown sparrow. Again, not to be con excuse me, confused with a chipping sparrow in breeding plumage, uh, but this guy has a very bold, distinct Rufus crown. And I, I sometimes call him the rock sparrow because you almost always see them perched on rocks. They like rocky hillsides. They like being down in cover, but if you see them hopping out in the open, they'll just hop up on a small rock or a boulder and they're very comfortable in, in rocky, uh, open hillsides. It's a very stocky sparrow, dusky gray sparrow, overall really dark with this big rufous crown. So you sh even though it's a rufous crown like a, a breeding chipping sparrow, everything else on this bird is quite different. They're dark overall, their uh, belly and breast are the same color as their nape and their back. Uh, they have a very undefined eye line. They, they can show a little bit of, a, of an eye ring, dark eye line behind the eye, but again, nothing in front of the eye like you see on the chipping sparrow. Very fine, not very well-defined malar stripe in, in this picture, but if you see them straight on, you can see like this guy down here, he's got a very thin, but still uh, noticeably well-defined malar stripe with a white submustachial stripe. So if you get one looking at you, you can see that show up pretty well. And they're usually found skulking, like I said, on rocky hillsides close to the ground. And they act like a towhee. They'll run around on the ground. They'll scratch around under cover. So if you see something that you think might have been a towhee run across between two trees or two bushes, but it's a little bit smaller, you're probably looking at a rufous crown sparrow. And let me play his sound. Very chattery, very fast, kind of jumbly. It, it kind of almost sounds like if you kicked a rock loose and it's bouncing down a hillside, kind of bouncing around randomly and then comes to rest. And that's just his little, little sharp chip note there. It's kind of a, more of a, a click, click note than a, a sharper chip, but yeah, so that is the Rufus Crown Sparrow. Uh, now we get into one that is honestly one of my favorite Mark Sparrows, the Black-Throated Sparrow or Blackbeard the Sparrow. Uh, this is more of a Western Desert Scrub Sparrow. Uh, you, I don't usually see them around Wimberley here very often, but as you go a little bit further west, kind of towards Junction, you start seeing this guy show up. You go up near Lano, you see him up there. Uh, they like scrubby habitat, desert habitat, and the facial patterns are very, very striking. I just look at how much black is on the throat here. And this is male and female. You see that big black bib and you'll know it's a black-throated sparrow. That's the only field mark. You see that on this sparrow. The only other thing that can kind of look like that potentially is a male house sparrow. They have that big black throat, but this, the colors overall on this bird is much different from a house sparrow. The habitat is very different. The beak is black. It's not a 
corn kernel yellow like your house sparrows big big bold eye line that stands out really well with a uh, kind of a half uh, eye ring down there below the eye but the back and the breast of this sparrow is very plain their back is brown their, their belly is white but down the the chin and the breast uh, is just pure black on these adult on the adult birds the juvenile bird lacks the black throat and has a little bit of streaking on the breast but still note that big single white eyebrow the half crescent facial marking under the eye and just the back will just be plain drab. There's no streaking on the back like some of the other, uh, like the Spizella sparrows would have. And look at that great big chunky uh, beak. It's a kind of a slate colored beak. And you see that white, white eyebrow is a giveaway for this guy, even if you don't see the black throat. And uh, just all light overall, but let me play his song. So very bubbly, liquid sounding uh, song for this bird. And so you'll, I associate this sound with a thorny scrubby habitat. You hear these mostly when you find them, they're going to be in, in kind of scrubland habitat and not in a, you know, you won't usually see these guys in a forest. You might see them on edge habitat, but they usually like big open fields. Now we come to the white crown sparrow, which is uh, again, a very widespread sparrow. And I call him the sharp dressed sparrow because everything on this bird is just crisp and clear. He's got that nice bold pattern on his head. So he's got a white or, or black eye line with white crown and white and black crown strike uh, streaks that is in the adult, very, very striking. The throat, the nape, the breast, the belly, it's all the same uniform gray. He's got some nice uh, kind of reddish and white markings on the back, but overall you see that crown and you know what this bird is. Just the one point of note on this guy, no yellow lures and no white uh, distinctive white on the throat. But the adult is very, very striking. And you can usually identify this guy pretty easily on sight. He's a large sparrow, very clean gray on the body, and that striking crown pattern. Uh, the bill can be pinkish to yellow. Uh, it just varies individual to individual. Uh, the, on, the one confusing part of this bird is this big guy I have shown down here is the first winter bird, which has a rufous crown instead of a white crown. You don't see as much dark striking patterns on them, but you can still note the same general patterns are there. They're just different colors. Instead of having black, it's just kind of more of a rufous reddish, but they still uh, are not as... Uh, dark drab colored brown brownish gray as the rufous crown sparrow and uh, just you'll see these usually the rufous crown sparrow you usually see uh, individually or in pairs these guys you'll see them in flocks so fairly often if you see a juvenile you'll see a, adults nearby and you can tell what it is but again nothing on the throat nothing on the breast nothing on the nape just overall very clean sharp looking sparrow let me play his song here. I'm trying to go a little bit fast because I know we're, uh, I don't want to keep y'all here too long. And we got a little bit of a late start. And you'll hear this coming from edge habitat, grassy areas, or they can go into woodland areas as well. And their chip note, or no, that's not their chip note. See, where's the chip note? Yeah, there we go. Just kind of an upticked chip, 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 chip. And let's go on to the next one that can be sometimes confused with this guy if you don't get a great look at him. Uh, we'll get into that in a second. It's our, well, which will be our next kind of group of sparrows is our unstreaked woodland sparrows. These last ones we've been looking at uh, have been more open area grassland sparrows. The white crown sparrow kind of is a transition bird. So I put him at the end here. They'll be in grassy areas, edge habitat, and sometimes into the woodlands as well. But then these next birds will be frequently heard or seen scratching around in the undergrowth, 
mottled appearance to help them hide in the woods instead of being clean and crisp like the, the birds you see out in the open. Uh, they have more shadowy patterns that help them hide. Uh, they can be skulky, but still fairly vocal. And if they come out in the open, they still like to stick close to cover. So uh, we had our white crown sparrow. The next one is our white throated sparrow. They do have similar crown patterns, but note the bold yellow lores. Even in the juvenile bird down here, they have yellow in the lores, which the white crown sparrow does not. And they have a very obvious, well, white throat that they are named for. It's distinctly different from the breast, which is much more modely in appearance. It's not as clean and crisp. Uh, so I kind of call this guy the, the working man sparrow. He's not cr clean and sharp dressed, but he is still a nice looking sparrow. He's got some bold facial markings, but he's also uh, a little bit husky and a little bit rough around the edges. So he's got a little bit of uh, more modely colors on the breast, more modely colored on the back, not as crisp looking, but still a, a fairly sharp facial markings and a very pretty little sparrow. And he is a, a very stout sparrow. They like to be undercover. Sometimes they'll be in groups, but they'll still be kind of scratching around in the undergrowth. And if you see them hop out, you'll just see this big bulky sparrow. And usually those yellow lores are, are very, very obvious when you see them pop out. So if you see sparrow with a white crown, yellow lores, white throat, being kind of skulky, uh, that is most likely your white throated sparrow. And let's uh, play his song. This is the one that kind of sounds like old Sam Peabody Peabody. And you'll hear these guys singing fairly often and you might have to track them down. You might not come out in the open, but you will still hear them singing. Now we come to the Harris's Sparrow, which is our giant sparrow. This is the largest sparrow in the United States. They are very big very bold facial patterns uh, and very distinct marking on the adult male, especially. You can see this guy down here, not just black on the throat like the black-throated sparrow, but it looks like someone took a black paintbrush and went all down the top front and back of this sparrow's head. It is black straight down the middle, all the way around the back, big heavy pink bill, chunky body. He does have a little bit of streaking. I wouldn't quite call that bold streaking like in the uh, song sparrow, but he does have some markings on the flanks and on the breast. They even in the females and the juveniles, they can have a very bold central breast splotch. It's bigger than a breast spot. So I call it a central, more of a, a big splotch of darkness in the middle there. But uh, they still have a dark crown, even if they don't have their full breeding black plumage in and you'll see they have a fairly large malar stripe, which goes all the way down to this breast splotch. It connects everything together. So you'll even if they don't have full black face color, facial coloring, it's still all kind of outlined. And these guys really like woodland edges. Sometimes they'll visit feeders, especially if you toss seed on the ground. But you'll see them if you drive down a wooded area with hedgerows or something down the side, you'll see them in small groups working around through there. But if you just see an absolutely enormous sparrow, you're probably looking at a Harris's sparrow. And let's listen to him. So kind of similar tone to uh, the white-throated sparrow, but it doesn't vary it. It's just singular notes that he repeats over and over. And so let's go on to our next sparrow, which is uh, the ninja sparrow, or the extremely varied sparrow, or the not a sparrow, the dark-eyed junco. Yes, they are classed in with sparrows. So I need to talk about him in there because he counts and he is a very neat bird to look at. So very obvious difference from most other sparrows that you would see. Still similar sparrow shapes, sparrow behavior. They like being in wooded areas. They like coming to feeders fairly often. Uh, most variants that we'll see around here have a dark hood. So the one that we see most common around Central Texas here is the slate colored subspecies. There are many, many different uh, subspecies, but you'll see this guy here is slate colored. His entire head, back, body, throat is all just a singular, well, slate color. And he has a little white belly. 
And sometimes the slate colored has a brown variant, but he still is fairly slate colored down the head and all down the breast. So if you see something that doesn't have a lot of very distinct facial markings and it all just kind of blends together, you're probably looking at uh, a dark eyed junco. Let me see, I think I have, yeah, this is another subspecies that we can get here, the Oregon junco. Uh, it's still dark eyed junco, but he just has the dark hood, but the back is kind of more reddish and the flanks are a little bit more pinkish. Then there's the pink sided, red backed, gray headed, which is more out in West Texas. Uh, and well, that does it for that. But you can see this, this individual species is extremely varied. So if you do see a junco, kind of learn to, to go off of them by shape. You can tell they all have the same similar shape, but just different color patterns laid over the top. Mostly, again, like I said, you'll see slate colored with a few Oregon mixed in around here. If you go out to West Texas or North Texas, you might see some of the, the pink headed, the red back, uh, the gray headed, uh, but you can call them all dark eyed juncos if you don't want to get into it. But if you want a little added fun to your birding trip, go look up some of the subspecies in your birding guide and, and have, a, have a look at the different fun subspecies. And all of them flash white in their tail when they fly. And they like to kind of flare their tail out when they fly. You can see that uh, in this image up here. Big, bold, obvious white outer tail feathers. And when they fly, they will flick their tail. So if you see flashes of white going away from you, especially if you're in a wooded area, you're probably looking at a dark eyed junco. Let's play his song. Again, similar pattern to a chipping sparrow, but a little bit more warbly. It's not dry, singular notes. It's, they've got a little bit of a warble to them. And again, they can vary it a little bit depending on where you are. So uh, we've got a little bit more time. If anyone needs to jump up and say we need to complete the meeting now, feel free to do so. But I'll run through a few of our less common sparrows, uh, try and play catch up from where we were before. But uh, hey, Jesse. Yes. Um, so the other thing is that I had turned the chat option off. I'm, okay. um, and our participant list is now gone from like 35 to 29. So I think our uh, uh, impersonators or in intruders yeah. have gone. They, they got yeah. bored with us. So I'm going to open up the chat again. If yeah, you I'll have questions for, for, uh, for Jesse, then put them in there and then we'll, we'll try to come back around to those. Yeah, that will be great. Yeah, any questions I'm happy to answer. But while people think of that and formulate their questions, I'll talk a little bit uh, somewhat quickly about some of our uncommon hill country sparrows, because I've all the ones that I've discussed so far are fairly possible sparrows that you can find around here with a decent uh, reliability if you go to the right habitat. But some of these other ones are a little bit less common, harder to find, uh, a little more secretive sometimes. They might be widespread, but just harder to see. And like you can see the Loch Ness Sparrow picture that I've shown here uh, is the, the rare sparrow that is sometimes hard to photograph. So Fox Sparrow, I love this sparrow. It's a gorgeously marked sparrow and I wish we had them around here more often. Uh, as you get a little further north, uh, especially up kind of around the Dallas area or the Panhandle area, you'll see these with a bit more regularity, but it's, uh, it, I call him the triangle spotted sparrow because he's got these little triangles or chevrons all down the breast, which no other sparrow has. They can look like streaks at first, but when you get a closer look at them, it's just this really interesting chevron-like markings going all down their, their breast and their flanks. Uh, they're a very plump sparrow, so you'll notice them first. They might almost look like a thrush when you first see them. It's this big, fat, round ball of sparrow. And they just have this very distinctive breast spotting and a kind of yellow corn kernel shaped bill. Like I said, there is one other sparrow that has that. It's the house sparrow, but you can see them. Every other marking other than the bill is very, very different from a house sparrow on this bird. They can vary from bright rusty colored like this lower bird to more brownish gray like the upper one. They do have uh, a large central breast spot, which is surrounded by those triangular like uh, chevron streaks. They have a, a little bit of a, a gray supercilium that's the part above the eye uh, that goes down into a gray nape. 
But if you see those triangles uh, on the breast, that is a diagnostic marking for this sparrow. You see that you're looking at a fox sparrow. Uh, I wish we could see more of these guys around here. They're really neat looking sparrows, but keep an eye out for them because I do see them occasionally show up in the area and they are worth your notice. And here's their song. Kind of sounds more like a finch to me. Very distinct kind of blurry sing song type song. Then we get the Casson Sparrow, which is kind of our, our performing sparrow. Because uh, they're a very uh, a smallish, sandy colored sparrow. They like western grassland areas. You'll see them in South Texas. You'll see them out west. Not a whole lot of very obvious markings when you just see them perched there. They've got little spots down the back, kind of reddish brown spots going down the back, creamy white underneath, very faint white outer tail feathers, very, very faint streaks on the breast, few facial markings besides the little eye ring. Uh, they might show a little bit of a dark malar and some very slight buffy lores, but overall it's a very nondescript sparrow other than the, the markings on the back but he is very easy to identify if you see him do his flight display. And in the spring, the males will definitely start doing a flight display. And, uh, and you can look at the beak. It's a kind of an, I didn't, I forgot to mention before, it's a little bit more elongated than some other sparrows, but you see this, the picture of this upper uh, uh, sparrow, he's doing his flight display and they sing while they're doing it. So here's the song. and they time their flight to that. So they'll fly up, kind of flutter their wings at during, as they're during, doing that middle part of their song, and then dive back down. So you'll, if you hear this song, you'll hear them, they'll fly up, Let's see if, and this is just this, their call note, this little, little faint chip, chip, chips. And even when they're doing their, their call note, they'll sometimes get carried away and toss part of their song in there. But when they're doing, if you hear that dee, 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 look up in the sky, because you'll see these guys flying up, kind of fluttering their wings out, like in this upper picture, spreading their tail, doing that. And then in the ending part of their song, they will dive back down and usually land perched on a fence or somewhere visible. So it's a fairly visible sparrow. Uh, that is most easily identified by behavior. And now the grasshopper sparrow, a very buffy breasted sparrow. Uh, it's a grassland sparrow. They love being in grassy areas, uh, very large bill, very yellow lores, buffy face. Uh, they've kind of got a very, uh, they've got a dark bisected crown. So you can see on this guy here, very dark crown lines with a single white stripe going down the middle. Uh, if you see that, it's a pretty good uh, indicator that you're looking at a grasshopper sparrow. And if you see it very, very briefly, that's another very good indicator that you're looking at a grasshopper sparrow because they don't like to stay up in the open very long. Uh, very yellow, yellow lures on some of them. They ha usually have a single little uh, stripe going back behind the eye and extending out into this one little ear spot. And sometimes you'll see a second little ear spot kind of curled in underneath that. It's not always visible, but if you see a little extended line behind a big white eye ring and one little ear spot, you're probably looking at a grasshopper sparrow, especially if it's very buffy and you don't get to see it for very long. Uh, like I said, they are very, very secretive. They have little spots on the back, which make them blend in extremely well. And the buffy color helps them blend in with dry grass. They will flush out occasionally uh, usually they will land right back into the grass. If you flush them two or three times, usually on the third flush, they will perch up somewhere in the open and you can get a look at them. So if you're able to kind of follow where the sparrow's gone and he'll eventually perch up and kind of give you a look like, what are you doing? Why are you following me around? And eventually give you a little bit of a, a, a look. But here, I'll play his song. And this is where he gets his name from. just a little tick tick ticky that sounds much like a grasshopper. And this is very, very soft. You have to be fairly near the sparrow to hear it. There have been a number of occasions where I have watched one through a spotting scope, watched him sing, and never heard a single note out of him. I could see his beak moving, but I could not hear the bird because he was too far away. So very secretive sparrow and uh, 
but notice that there's no streaking on the breast or the flanks, which is very important because our next secretive sparrow is the Lacan sparrow. Uh, the crouching tiger hidden sparrow is the name I gave to this one because he's very orangey color, kind of buffy orangey color. And he is one of the most skulky sparrows you will find around here in the hill country. Uh, visually, he's somewhat similar to uh, the grasshopper sparrow. Again, they're, they're in the same genus, Amadramus but he is streaked on the flanks and the breast, very finely streaked, but much more obviously streaked than the grasshopper sparrow. Beautiful patterns. The nape of the neck has almost got these purple spots on it, very buffy face. Notice that he also has a little dark eye line like the grass or line going behind the eye like the grasshopper sparrow, but instead of having uh, just one little cheek spot, he has an entirely gray cheek patch. So if you see that gray cheek patch combined with being very buffy and having a little bit of streaks on the breast, then you're looking at a Lacan sparrow. And they also have a bisected white crown, but really streaky on the back, very white belly uh, and uh, streaky on the flanks and extremely, extremely secretive. No matter how many times you flush this sparrow, you will rarely ever see them actually perch up anywhere. Uh, so you have to take really quick looks if you get one or just if every now and then one will perch up for a few seconds on top of a, a piece of grass or something, but you'll rarely see them out in the open. Let me play his song. Again, kind of buzzy and very short. And th these guys kind of like moist habitat as well. I see them in salt marshes sometimes in slightly marshy habitats. They don't like it as marshy wet as the swamp sparrow, but generally grasshopper sparrow likes drier areas. Lacan sparrow uh, is uh, in more uh, wet areas, not super wet, but just kind of damp. And so Finally, I want to talk on a few locally common sparrows, sparrows that uh, you have to go to specific places to see that are here in Texas, but you just have to be in the right place at the right time. So one of the most obvious ones is the olive sparrow. We don't get those here in the hill country yet, but they are all over, excuse me, all over South Texas, fairly shy sparrow found in South Texas. They will come to feeders if you're patient, but they don't like coming out into the sun. I've watched one walk through the shadows and make a zigzag pattern just to skip going through any patches of sunlight. So they like staying very secretive. But the markings are fairly obvious. They're really our only sparrow with a lot of green on them. The only thing I could get it confused with is green-tailed towhee, and the facial pattern is quite a bit different on them. Uh, and they're not common in South Texas either. But you can see just all this green olive color on the wings and the tail. It does have a little bit of chestnut stripes on the head uh, and a little uh, eye line that goes through the eye with a bisected white eye ring. But overall, you see that green on the sparrow in South Texas, you're looking at an olive sparrow. They're very common there, just very skulky and sometimes hard to see, but you can hear them and they sound kind of like if you took a metal ball bearing and dropped it on concrete. It just speeds up. Little metal ball bouncing to rest is the olive sparrow. Uh, then we have our seaside sparrow, a very dark coastal sparrow. It's our, probably our dark, one of our darkest overall sparrows. It also has yellow lures, but just notice how dark overall this sparrow looks. It can almost look black when you see it at first. It has a very obvious white contrasty throat with a dark malar stripe and a very contrasty submustachial stripe. Very, very large beak. You see a bird in a salt marsh with a very large beak yellow lures and really, really dark overall, you are looking at a seaside sparrow. Uh, gray crown and nape, gray breast, gray back, gray body. Everything is dark gray. They rarely ever come out of the grass and they rarely ever leave uh, the, well, the seaside. They like being in salt marshes. So if you're in an inland grassy area near the coast, you're probably not seeing a seaside sparrow. If you're smelling salt and the bottom of your car is starting to corrode from all the brine that you're driving through to get to the area and you see a dark bird sparrow flying through uh, the Spartina grass down there, you're most likely looking at a seaside sparrow. 
they make very short, fluttery, low flights, kind of like house sparrows do, but instead of flying through parking lots, they fly through salt marshes. And let me play his song. Kind of a funky little, it's very short, but a fairly distinct, almost kind of like a red winged blackbird, but not. A little bit more blurry, a little bit more, more of a squeak to it. And then they have this really nasal chip note that they give as well. And they don't like to come up out of the grass, but if you pish, you'll see their heads pop up out of all the little salt marshes. So you go into the salt marsh and you'll have a good chance of finding these, even at any time of the year, they're down there all the time. And in the same habitat uh, as the seaside sparrow, you can get this guy, the Nelson sparrow. Uh, they sound, their sound sounds like they're pishing and they're very buffy. So I call them the buffy pishing sparrow. A uh, very colorful, gorgeous bird, even more orangey colored uh, than the Lacan sparrow. They like salt water, they like fresh water, but they're usually found down near the coast. They like wetlands. A uh, very bright buffy supercilium. Uh, throat and breast is buffy and streaked, kind of like the Lacan sparrow. But the crown on this one, and this isn't the best angle to show them, uh, it does not have a white line bisecting it. So it has a gray center down the crown. So if you see the sparrow and you see the crown and it doesn't have a line down the middle of it, and it's a very buffy looking sparrow, you're probably looking at a Nelson sparrow if you're down on the coast. You can find Lacan sparrow down there as well. Just this last week, I was down on the coast and from the same area, we had a Lacan sparrow, a seaside sparrow and a Nelson sparrow. Um, the Lacan's was very obvious when he popped up because he had a single white line down the middle of his crown, while all the Nelsons that we were looking at did not. But very buffy, very streaky, white streaks down the back, very fine white eye line, uh, and, but also very, very secretive. And they'll almost never come out on their own, but if you pish a little bit, they do pop up. And this is what they sound like. Yeah, that's basically a psh very, very short, very indistinct. But uh, if you're in the right habitat and you hear a bird pishing back at you, it's probably the Nelson Sparrow. <clears throat> so that's, <clears throat> excuse me, that basically does it for the sparrows. <clears throat> as, I can, as you can tell, my throat's starting to dry out a little bit, but we'll quickly run through a couple birds that can be confused with sparrows, just to not let you get confused with them. Uh, Dick Sissel, fairly obvious, lots of yellow on them. Big bunting-like bird found in grasslands. They come back in the springtime. But if you see a bird with lots and lots of yellow on the breast, uh, you're probably not looking at a sparrow. And they get their name from their sound. Sounds like dick, dick, sil, sil, sil. But I'll, I'll kind of brush through these fairly quickly. Buntings in general are related to sparrows, but uh, I've never seen a sparrow with that much coloration on them. Painted bunting is very obviously different from any type of sparrow you'd see, even though their behavior can be somewhat similar. The indigo buntings can look a little bit more like sparrows, especially the females. The males, obviously nice bright blue. Females, uh, they can be more sparrowish looking. They're kind of grayish brown with some streaks on the breast more warm cinnamon color overall, but note that there is no real markings on the face. They might have a faint eye line, but uh, they've got a couple little buffy wing bars, but overall not really any distinct field marks. Uh, the shape is obviously different from the Brewer's Sparrow that has a much bigger beak. It's not a pink beak. And so if you see a little nondescript bird like this without any streaking on the back, I remember streaking on the back, nondescript sparrow can be your Cassin sparrow. But uh, again, don't confuse the indigo buntings with, uh, with your sparrows. And very frequently, even uh, non-breeding male indigos, and sometimes even the females will have a few little blue feathers on them. So if you see blue feathers starting to show up, uh, you're not looking at a sparrow, you're looking at a bunting. So our next one, uh, other buntings that we get around here is the lazuli bunting. Not as much streaking on the breast of the female, but even the female and uh, immature males uh, will have a little bit of blue on the wing. So if you see that, no streaking on the breast, but very cinnamon color. Uh, and they've got kind of a more peaked crown to the head. You're probably looking at a female lazuli bunting. And these, they show up here in the hill country sometimes. They get more common as you go further west. 
uh, brown-headed cowbirds, uh, everyone's favorite, least favorite yeah. bird, uh, found all over the place. Uh, the females can look kind of sparrowish, but just look at the shape of the head and this big, elongated, chunky bill. There isn't any of the plain sparrows that have that big and dark of a bill. They're either going to be small and pink or small and delicate, but just the shape of the bird uh, seems more like a blackbird because it is. It's not a sparrow. The legs are longer. The stance is different. The only uh, sparrow that would really stand like a brown-headed cowbird is the lark sparrow, and their facial markings and overall markings are vastly different than the plain drab, all brown, basically unmarked female brown-headed cowbird. Uh, blue grosbeak is another one of those where the male is very obvious, but the female can kind of look brownish cinnamon color like a sparrow. But just look at the gross beak, that really, really big beak. It's bigger than anything you get in any sparrow. If you see that big, massive, heavy beak, you're going to want to look uh, in the gross beak section of your bird guide instead of in the sparrow section, because it's most likely a blue gross beak uh, or, or one of the other types of gross beaks that occasionally shows up here as well. Uh, Rose-breasted gross beaks come through, black-headed gross beaks come through, and they all have those very big, obvious, large bills that you'll never see in any of the sparrows. Uh, we've got our house finches. Again, the beak is different. It's kind of a more round colman. Uh, that top of the beak is more rounded. Uh, it's more short and stubby and lots and lots of streaking on the breast. Uh, it's kind of the same boat as the female red winged blackbird. You just don't see sparrows that are nondescript in the face that have that much streaking all down the breast. So if you see a shorter kind of more rounded bill, uh, you're probably looking at a female house finch if it's got all those kind of blurry streaks on them. And usually house finches are fairly social and you'll see them with the much more obvious male uh, finches as well. Um, our pine siskins, which I've sadly been lacking uh, this year, have not seen very many pine siskins. They can kind of look sparrowy, but very thin, needly pointed bill and yellow in the wings. None of the sparrows you'll see will have that pointed of a bill and be that yellow in the wings. So don't, again, don't get confused just because they're a little brown and streaky. Look for the short tail, yellow wings, and a uh, little needle pointed bill. And usually uh, descending on your feeders in dozens, they usually form great big flocks, but eh, I have not seen many this year, so they might change that behavior. Uh, then we've got the American pipit. Again, the beak is very different, but their behavior can be similar to sparrows. They'll hop around on the ground, they'll walk around on the ground, they'll be in little flocks. But just look at that little thin bill. It looks more like a warbler bill than like a sparrow bill. And they sparrows usually hop. American pipits have this little funny bobbing walk that they'll do, and they'll kind of bob their tail as they walk along the ground. So if you see tail bobbing, there's not really any sparrow that normally bobs its tail. So you're probably looking at an American pipit uh, or a Sprague's pipit. It's a, a solitary, this is a more solitary pipit. You'll see them out in the grasslands. You might flush them up out like a sparrow. And you can initially confused if you're just looking at the body or looking at the flight, it could be a sparrow. But uh, look at the beak and look at those great big bug eyes. The Sprague's pipit always look like they've got these great big funky looking eyes and this big long beak. And they have this kind of unique stair step flight that they give when you flush them out and big white outer tail feathers. Uh, it's, it's a great bird to look for. They're hard to find. So if you can find a Sprague's pipit, uh, that's a special bird. Don't just discount it as being, oh, it's just a little brown sparrow. Take a closer look at it. See if it's an interesting sparrow or see if it's a Sprague's pipit. Uh, so uh, now I'll open it up to questions and we'll do a few practice sparrows. If anyone wants to throw out their ideas on what this sparrow is, this is our first, first identification uh, of sparrows. Okay, uh, Jesse, yes. on that note, um, I just allowed everyone to unmute themselves. So okay, they, if they want to chime in, they can do that. Um, and I have one question. Kim Dean asked a really, really good question. So I, and I want to get this in there while everybody's IDing this yeah. bird. So she's new to birding and she wants you to explain pishing. Okay, pishing. Ah, yeah, thank you for asking the question. Uh, yeah, that is uh, referred to a sound that bird watchers can make that kind of mimics the scold call of uh, other birds. It can sound like wrens, it can sound like sparrows. And that's just where you go it's almost like you're shushing someone, but you just kind of add a little psh, psh, psh to it. And 
uh, think of like a Buick's Wren or a Carolina Wren that's making a fussy scolding call or a tip mouse and try and mimic that. And often it will get the other birds agitated. They wanna see what's going on and they'll pop up and they'll come out in the open to see what this other bird is fussing at. If it's a snake or a hawk or an owl that they're trying to scare away, birds are curious. And if you make this kind of an alarm call sound that the pishing imitates, that uh, will get the other birds to pop up and it works on sparrows, works on cardinals, warblers, a whole bunch of different birds you can uh, bring up by pishing. And I do see another question that uh, gets sparrows and finch mixed up. Uh, that comes down to some structural differences. Usually the finches have a different shaped bill. It's not quite as sharply conical. Uh, the house finches, especially around here, they have more curved bill. Their songs are a little different. It's more liquidy sounding songs and just kind of a, a little bit different shape and behavior. Usually finches will fly around, they'll stick towards the treetops, they'll come to the feeders, they don't feed on the ground as often, they'll feed on seed heads and flowers, and they won't come down to the ground like the sparrows will. So a little bit of differences in behaviors. But uh, so people have had a chance now, does anyone wanna guess what this sparrow is? How about lark? Lark. Sparrow. That is correct. This is our lark sparrow. Very, very well defined facial markings, uh, rusty crown and ear coverts, long body, and white outer tail feathers. So let's look at one more sparrow here. We've got this guy out here. He's sitting out in the middle of this grassy field. Let's put our binoculars up and zoom in on him a little bit. <laughs> Anyone got an idea on this guy? And feel free to call out field marks as you see them as well. Anyone care to guess? Let's look at some of these and see if we can identify a little bit here. Notice this big, bold stripe there, barring on the flanks. Oh. Let's... Song sparrow? This is a song sparrow, excellent. Oh, yeah. Oh, but it's in the grass. Yep. <laughs> yeah, uh, this one is out in the open. Remember I said they'll come yeah. out in the open. The Lincoln Sparrow stays close to, to the edge. The Song Sparrow is not afraid to come out in the open. So Habitat can mm -hmm. tell you a lot about this bird. Very rounded head in the open, chunky body, big mallard stripe, and bold streaks along the flanks. So I think I've got one more Sparrow in here. One more little sparrow, kind of nondescript. Anyone see anything, any facial markings? Got a guess on here? Nope. Brewers. That is Brewers Sparrow. Oh, that's what I thought too. You wow. got it. You all got it. You've been paying attention. Very plain, unmarked, <laughs> small, unstreaked breast, pale lores, and full eye ring. That makes this a Brewers Sparrow. So thank you for listening to the talk. I had a fun time doing this. If anyone has any questions, feel free to, to ask away now or contact me afterwards. Uh, my website is hoothavian.com. You can reach me through that. And I, if it recorded, uh, I hope it looks like it's still recording. Uh, I uh, will post the video up to my YouTube page, which you can just look up Huth Avian on YouTube. Uh, if you want to come back or if you want to share it with a friend or someone and send it out, I will, I'll put a copy of this presentation uh, minus the uh, earlier interruptions <laughs> on to YouTube. Thank you. And uh, you can come back and get a refresher course on sparrows whenever you want. So I could one good, one good thing about uh, being, being live is you probably won't get hacked. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, and once it's up on YouTube, you won't have to worry about that anymore. Thank you, Ju thank you, Jesse. Thanks, Thank, Jesse. thank yes. you for listening. Thank so you. I'll stop the recording here.